Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. This is the matter of State of Connecticut versus Lopez Dulos. Would counsel please identify themselves for the record? Richard Flange, Lopez State, Your Honor, with Dan Thomas. Norm Pettis on behalf of Mr. Dulos. And Judge, I have a young intern, Patrick Nugent, who's on his way to law school with me. Hopefully, hopefully to help me from getting in trouble with you. Good morning, counsel. The court met with counsel in chambers to discuss the sequence in which we're going to address a number of pending motions and scheduling a future court date. Anything before we get to the pending motion? No, Your Honor. Nothing for the defense. First is the defense motion to preserve evidence. Actually, there are two motions in regard to certain seized property. State, wish to respond? I actually see one motion, Your Honor, filed on June 13th, the motion to preserve evidence. I have no objection to this. It's something that we're doing actively, too. When I got it, it was something we were doing anyway. All right, that motion is granted by agreement. Next, we have a defense motion requesting that the court conduct an in-camera inspection of Jennifer Dulos' medical records in the possession of Anthem Blue Cross. Attorney Pattis? So we've come into possession of medical records from the period of April through, excuse me, from the period of February through April of this year, reflecting $14,000 worth of medical tests. The testing reflects blood work, diagnostic tests, and reproductive tests. We don't know, and we received these items as having been paid by Anthem Blue Cross. The coding on the items do not permit us to determine what the testing was for, nor does it permit us to identify the provider. Upon information and belief, however, these are for New York providers. And so we are looking for these items to develop information that is consistent with our theory of the case. That is that Ms. Dulos may have been despondent at or about the time she disappeared and may or may not have taken steps to make good on her promise to Mr. Dulos that he would never have a relationship with the children again. If, in fact, she was seriously ill or believed herself to be seriously ill, that would be supportive of that theory. This theory is supported in part, and I'm mindful of the requirements to make a prima facie showing under such cases as State v. Esposito. This is consistent in part with information that we learned in the family court that I am not at liberty, given current family court orders, to put on the record at this time. But we believe that that evidence, together with evidence we are aware of in the family court file, would be sufficient for us to raise questions about her stability, her state of mind, and the extent to which she was willing and able to go make through on dire threats that conveyed to Mr. Dulos that she would do anything necessary to make sure he never saw his kids. Don't know what these records are. We believe that they, given the billing information we have, we know that the custodian is in Anthem, or is in Connecticut, rather. And so we have jurisdiction over that person under our current discovery. We would propose that you order them to provide the records, that they come to you in camera, and then you determine whether we can get the identity of the providers in New York. At that point, then, we'd have to resort to interstate process to try to compel production of those records. So we're not asking that the records be given to us. We're asking that they be given to you so you can determine whether we get them. Just briefly, Your Honor, counsel talked about Esposito and the cases that follow Esposito. They talk about no fishing expeditions. This is exactly what this is. It's a fishing expedition to determine what these records are. There's been no, there has not been, if you're going to use the Esposito standard, there has not been a showing to indicate that this is more than a hunch on the defendant's part to gain, actually, even the court to have access to look at these records. So I'd ask that you deny the defendant's request. More than a hunch, Judge. Most of us go through a lifetime and don't accumulate those sort of medical bills. This is in the two months before she's disappeared. I reiterate what I said in chambers. To date, we have not been provided with one iota of evidence that we can actually review and see ourselves. 
that supports the wild speculation that the state has engaged in here that she was murdered. Um, if she's gone, we don't know why. And I think we're entitled to discover information um, that leads us to, the, to, to those answers, especially given the state's refusal to provide us with any information about what it's, uh, you know, it says in its warrants there was evidence of a violent struggle in New Canaan. I'm not in, required to take at face value that warrant. I have a responsibility to Mr. Dulo to take to test the state's theory of the case. If they give me nothing, I've got to go somewhere to get something. I've made application for material in this court. The state's not responded yet. Um, I'm not going to sit idly by uh, while the state blows hundreds of thousands of dollars in the futile effort to prove that Mr. Dulos is a murderer. He's not. And I am entitled under the Sixth Amendment to develop uh, alternative defense theories, and that's what I'm doing. It doesn't justify a response. Well, Attorney Pattis, I don't think that given the state of this record, you've sufficiently shown enough of a basis for the court to grant this motion. I think it is speculative at this juncture. I will deny your motion for order without prejudice. You may renew it if you believe you can develop sufficient facts to, for the court to grant it. Now, uh, if, in fact, the Medicare, the uh, family court study surfaces um, judge in some form that I can have access to, I will renew the motion at that time. We have... Um, Motion for return of seized property. I think we have agreement on that, Judge. There were two, Your Honor. One. Uh, That's the one I referenced to. I misspoke. Yes. The one filed motions. on June thirteenth, and the other filed on August fifth. Um, the. I don't know which you want to address. I mean, basically, the June thirteenth covers. Ford Raptor, a Chevy Suburban, a Cherokee, a server, a MacBook, uh, other computers, two iPhones, a hard drive, two external drives, and personal papers. Um, I had spoke to counsel, and he indicated that he would like some of the vehicles returned, and I'm willing to, if he's willing to stipulate secondary evidence with regard to two of the vehicles, um, we could probably make that happen. Um, as to everything else, uh, I don't know if he's pushing that or not, but the state would object to anything else being returned. And time. which two vehicles, please? Uh, that would be the Chevy Suburban that was uh, in Mr. Dulos's cost, uh, care um, and the Ch uh, Jeep Cherokee, those two vehicles, Your Honor. We would stipulate the secondary evidence as to the, 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 the Cherokee and the Suburban. Um, we understand that the state continues to uh, attempt to develop evidence uh, from the Raptor and make no claim as to that. As to the electronic items, I'm at a loss. I've been provided with no discovery about the electronic items, zilch. And so the state sat on them now for 10 weeks or however long this case has lingered and is telling me my client can't have his effects back because we're not done with them, but we can't tell you what we're doing with them, and we're not going to share with you what we've done. I mean, at some point, um, it begins to feel a little bit star chamber-like and inquisitorial. Uh, we have a Fourth Amendment that talks about reasonable searches and seizures. I understand the law enforcement and investigative privilege, but the fact of the matter is the Fourth Amendment has uses the word reasonable for a reason. Um, and that is, the state doesn't get to do whatever it likes for as long as it likes and say, yeah, you hooky, you don't get anything. We're privileged. We're the state of Connecticut. This is Fotis Dulles. He's got constitutional rights that we want vindicated in this case. Counsel, I assure you, I, I'm here to protect the constitutional rights of all interested parties. What's the state's position? With Judge, if I may, we did discuss yeah. these motions in chambers and, and, and kind of the backslap I just received with Attorney Pattis. In chambers, it was my understanding that, that he wasn't going to address any of these issues. So I, I don't know if this kind of dovetails into um, my motion to gag, and we'll deal with that. But these type of comments that are made constantly extrajudicially, um, you know, we did discuss these. He indicated that he understood that it was ongoing investigation and he wasn't going to push them. But now here in court, he is. So no. I will just reiterate. I, I will reiterate that um, you know it is an ongoing investigation. I did let him know that I haven't received an extraction for Mr. Duell's phone. As soon as I do, I was going to be providing him that. In a conversation I had with him, I told him that I was going to be efforting to get that because he wanted it. And, and I understand I don't have it yet, so I don't have it to give. So I'm trying to get that for him. Uh, so here we are. So as far as the, the electronics, as far as the Raptor, 
Um, we are continuing to um, go through, and some of them have evidence on them that um, haven't been disclosed yet, and, and you know, it's part of an ongoing investigation, so we don't have to turn those over or return them. I hadn't expected to address the electronic devices. I thought we had an agreement on the cars. The state did, I respond. Um, I don't know just what to make of the case. I mean, I see a warrant that talks about placing them via electronic devices at 136 in Farmington. I believe those devices put them in his home all morning long, and I wonder why the warrant's silent on that and why I don't have any. Can we just get a date where we can at least address these issues? My client has been maligned worldwide and accused of murder with charges that had it followed. Um, at what point do we get his material back so that we can begin to evaluate what the state's doing? Council wants to file a motion. We'll address it when he follows. Well, I'm going to accept the stipulation for secondary evidence as to the defendant's Chevrolet Suburban Jeep Cherokee, so those may be returned once sufficient photographic or video evidence has been memorialized. The other property will have to wait a future court date and further discovery. We also have the defense motion to modify conditions of release, particularly with respect to the GPS bracelet that Mr. Dulos is wearing, Attorney Pattis. My understanding from the discussion in chambers is that the court was going to deny that motion, so rather than address it, I understood the court's reasoning. Attorney Colangelo? Judge, there also was a... a well, before second. we get off that point, the reason the court is going to deny it, I, um, in receipt of a report which I've shared with counsel, that indicates that your request to put it on the wrist is not practical or feasible because unless there's a true medical emergency, um, regardless of how tight they're able to fit the device on the defendant's wrist, there's a very high probability that someone is able to remove such a device undetected versus the ankle. So if it is causing irritation to your client's ankle, the court's happy to allow it to be switched to the other ankle, but the motion to have the device located on the defendant's wrist is denied. The, there's also a pending... Judge, one second on yes. that, on conditions of release. Um, counsel also did file on June 24th a motion to clarify his conditions of release with regard to him um, having contact with the, the co-defendant, Michelle, Michelle Chaconis, and there was never a ruling in this matter against Mr. Dulos with regard to that motion. I don't know if counsel, what counsel wants to do with that motion. It is out sure. there. Yeah, I, I, we didn't discuss it, but I am prepared. Um, in the course of a property transfer, um, and, uh, a representative of Mr. Dulos was approached by Mr. Conis, who reported that she both loved him, didn't believe he was involved, and was sorry that this had occurred. Uh, these charges against him had been lodged, and that she believed him to be innocent. Um, we took that as an invitation to say hello, and we'd like to say hello. We'd like to discuss with her what she has discussed with the state. Um, and to date, whether we, we've been told um, that she's provided a statement to the police that is largely exculpatory as to herself and potentially as to Mr. Dulos. We don't have that either. And so it, we, we know she's cooperated. And we know she's spoken to the state on one or more occasions. Uh, we've been given no discovery about that. We believe some of it's exculpatory. Um, I have made contact with Mr. Bowman myself in an effort to discuss things with her, and he has made clear that they do not want us to have contact with her, so we stopped. Um, he did that in writing as well. Yeah, so I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know that a court order is necessary. Uh, so we have certain, I, I mean, I, I have information that I'm going to be providing to Mr. Bowman today, mail that's accumulated in Fotis' home for um, Mr. Conis. I'll pass that along. I presume he'll give it to her. Um, that's the extent of it. I know Your Honor wanted to deal with open motions. This is an open motion. Since that time that he filed this, Attorney Bowman filed in her, in Mr. Conis's case, um, a motion to prevent any contact between this defendant and that defendant. Uh, that was granted the last time that um, Mr. Conis was here in court. So I'd ask Judge you. White's order. I'm, I'm that's gonna, correct. In light of the record, I will extend the order to include Mr. Dulos is precluded from having any contact with his co-defendant. The last motion, Your Honor, we have is my uh, motion for order preventing the parties from making statements to the media or in public setting that would pose a substantial likelihood of material prejudice to the case. Um, just briefly, Your Honor, and, and I'll respond to counsel's argument if I can, but uh, 
the, the practice book and the rules of professional responsibility are pretty clear. Um, any statements that are extrajudicial that could or um, would pose a likelihood of materially prejudicing or the adjudicated proceeding um, are or shouldn't be made. I mean, that is our responsibility as attorneys. You know, counsel brings up subsection B of the of 3.6, which I talked about A in my motion, um, and he can make certain statements, and that is true, um, but uh, it, it's the state's contention that his statements are out of bounds, and I would ask that you um, enter the order. I don't think my statements are out of bounds at all, and the state has not violated <coughs> one, and so basically what it did is took paragraph A of the rule that all lawyers are obliged to obey and ask you to tell me to obey. I'm aware of what my professional responsibilities are. If you want to enter an order that I not kill anyone willfully on the way out of here today, I'll accept that order too, but it would be as much of a surplus as just the state's. 3.6b, which the state didn't recite in its motion, gives me the ability to respond to adverse publicity that is substantial. And I cannot think of a case I've handled with the possible exception of the Manhattan Madam years ago in, 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 East, in uh, New York where that's attracted more attention. Not a day goes by that I am not contacted by one or more media people to comment on this, that, or the other allegation. Those allegations are coming from unnamed law enforcement sources over whom Mr. Colangelo is, uh, has responsible for whom the state of Connecticut through Mr. Colangelo has responsibility. Am I to say we've learned, for example, um, you know, that there's a missing knife and there's this fellow whose name I know and I haven't disclosed, by the way. Um, um, you know, and we lost the knife, and the police lost the knife, um, and they think that Mr. Du um, you know, Mr. Dulos had it. Should I let that go uncommented upon, it, or should I say that's ridiculous? I'm aware of no such evidence. I get a report that it is the, the blouse that Ms. Dulos is believed to have worn uh, the day she disappears has been recovered, um, thus creating yet another public firestorm. That somehow, she was the very, the very clothing, bloodstained clothing she had on has been recovered. Uh, this comes apparently from a source close to the investigation, either law enforcement or a spokesperson for uh, Jennifer's family. I'm supposed to let that pass? I don't think I am. What's more, the, what's driving public interest in this case is the preoccupation with the suspicion that Mr. Dulos is guilty of murder. There are no murder charges in this case. I'm unaware that there will be any in the near term. As a matter of law, in fact, I don't think the evidence is sufficient to support such charges. But yet, here we go, exhibits 1 through 50, or however many reporters are in here today, they're all going to write about the missing mom and Mr. Dulos and the suspicions about him. At what point does he lose the right to stand up and say, I'm presumed innocent, and if you're going to talk, I'm going to talk back? Or again, in the family courts up in Hartford, there is a lawyer who is engaged in a divorce with his wife, and Mr. Dulos is reported to have tried to broker a meeting between the two of them. Headline, Stanford Advocate, Dulos offered room as sex and the lawyer. I did a quick double take when I read that story. I'm thinking, really? Lawyer? Troubled marriage? Sex pad? I don't want my wife, to, my wife to read that. Then I was relieved to find out it wasn't about me. We're not going to sit back silently and be crucified in the press. It's just not going to happen. And 3.6b does not require it to. Um, indeed, I would take the position that I have an obligation on Mr. Dulos's behalf to fight back, and we will fight back. Um, you know, it's not my responsibility um, to control the state agents. I have no control over the press. But if I'm presented with an allegation, I'm going to respond. And I had a lot to say about what happened up in Hartford this week um, when, they, when the ex-wife of Fotis's former lawyer sought a protective order. I called it histrionic nonsense. Now, what adjudicative proceeding did that impact? There's no jury here. And 3.6 is, is sounds in the report requirement of assuring that there are fair trials. We're a long way from a jury trial in this case. And there's a lot that I could say and haven't said. For example, uh, we're aware of a lot of missing money that was taken from Mr. Dulos's accounts by Jennifer. Um, I haven't gone to the press with that. Uh, when and if it arises, I'll raise the question. Um, there are many other items I could talk about, about third parties we're looking at in the case. We'll address those issues at trial. Mr. Dulos may or may not have something to say about the allegations with respect to bloody items in Hartford. We'll save that for trial. But if somebody's going to call me up or going to run to the press and say that Mr. Dulos did X and he didn't do it, you bet your bottom dollar I'm going to have something to say about it. 
And if this court issues a gag order, we will take uh, an immediate public interest appeal to the Connecticut Supreme Court. If it's upheld there, then I suspect Mr. Dulos will hire a private firm and engage in his right to speak. He can't do indirectly what I'm ordering him to do directly if, if I do issue such You can't order. issue an order gagging him. Nebraska, they're, they're, the United States Supreme Court has never upheld a gag order in a criminal case of a defendant. And I challenge this court to find the authority to do so in our existing case law. I don't see the term gag order anywhere in the rules of professional conduct. And the, your memorandum in opposition seems to be somewhat contemptuous of that provision. I understand there is a safe harbor. My memo is not contemptuous of the rule. It's contemptuous of how the rule has been used in this case, and it's contemptuous of the state's motion in this case. To suggest that we are prejudicing an ongoing adjudicative proceeding when there is no murder charge, there is no adjudicative proceeding to prejudice. Our objective is to cast enough doubts on the state's case such that we never have to face a murder charge. And we will go to the press and make that case. Just briefly, looking at the rule, Your Honor, and the commentary with regard to that rule, those extrajudicial statements that might otherwise raise a question under the rule may be permissible when they are made in response to statements made publicly by another party, another party's lawyer, or third parties, where a reasonable lawyer would believe a public response is required in order to avoid prejudice to the lawyer's client. When prejudicial statements have been publicly made by others, responsive statements may have a salutary effect on lessening any resulting adversary adverse impact on the adjudicative process. Such responsive statements should be limited to contain only such information as necessary to mitigate undue prejudice created by the statements made by others. So counsel talks about, and I, um, Your Honor, we were able to find, uh, where is this? Uh, State versus Grant, uh, an opinion by Judge Fasano in that matter in uh, New Haven uh, for the uh, homicide there, appendix there when the court in that case indicated that an article featuring defense attorney's assessment analysis and characterization of the state's case against his client um, were inappropriate. And just to point out a couple of counsel's comments, Your Honor, so that we have context of where my motion is coming from. You know, his comment on the evidence, what he sees or doesn't see, I mean, those are statements that are made only to prejudice the jury. I mean, that are, that those don't go to, you know, saving and protecting his client. Uh, the comment on, on defenses, you know, the gone girl defense, I mean, that is to prejudice the jury. And lastly, comments on other defendants. You know, there's been comments by the, by the counsel about a lie detector test taken by a, a co-defendant. It never happened. So not only are you know, we're spreading information out there that's not only not true, but it has a prejudicial effect. Those are the statements that I'm asking Your Honor to prevent. I get that counsel has an obligation to his client. I get that the rule allows him to make comments. I just want to make sure that he's staying within the bounds. Thank you. Judge, reading the rules is not an analysis of the rule. I'm re relieved to learn that Mr. Colangelo most to read, but I never doubted that he could. What I doubt is his ability to analyze. Um, the warrant that has been made a matter of public record talks about Mr. Duva clearly being evident, um, um, disposing of items in Hartford. And the press has seen fit to say that that's, he stopped 30 or 40 times, and there were even reports that he must have disposed 30 or 40 bags of body parts or items associated with it. That's just not true. What I have been see, provided with is a, is a photograph or a digital material that may or may not be him, a truck that may or may not be his, and it's not altogether clear. The digital thing is focused right on his license plate. They can't even make the license plate number up. But yet, if you look at the urban legend as reported in the press, he stopped 30 times to dispose of body parts or items. It's just not true. And I'm not going to permit that to become solidified in the public mind. As to the Gone Girl references, I've not shared with the, the public the 551-page novel that she wrote. But Joan Gillian, the author of Gone Girl, that says she's sickened by what I have to say. And I'm going to sit back and let a popular author do that to me and or my client. No, my response was, be gone, girl. She knows less about the case than anybody who's commented on it. And I'm sure she wasn't bitching and moaning when her royalties went up for selling more books. As to the prejudice on potential jurors, there are no jurors here. We're not even close. But that's the court's ultimate goal here. I understand this matter is going to go to trial, but I want to ensure that both the state and the accused have a fair jury. And that's what voir dire is for, and that's why we do it on an individual sequester basis. 
I've had experience in high profile cases before where I expected I would never get a fair and impartial jury. My experience, I don't know that it would be possible right now, I suspect it would, because one of the things I've learned is that most people have their own troubles and don't pay attention to the troubles of others. I've been stunned in the weeks and months that I've taken to pick juries in some cases to learn that most jurors don't even know anything other than that there's a case. The case I've worried about for months, they've never thought about at all. Um, so I think the time to worry about that is in voir dire, and at this point we don't even contemplate a motion for a change of venue. At the rate discovery is coming in, by the time this case is, uh, gets to trial, um, we will probably have had two or three other cause celebrities intervene. So I don't think I've, I've not introduced items into the public domain that have not been brought to me by others, by third parties. And some of those are law enforcement officers who've already spoken to other press people, and I'm being asked to comment on those things. It would be fundamentally unfair for this court to tie my hands. I am well aware of 3.6a, I am well aware of 3.6b, and I daily gamble with my law license. If this- No one wants you gambling with your law license. I will. And if Mr. Colangelo believes I've violated the rules of professional conduct, he knows what the remedy is. I don't believe this court needs to issue an order, and I'm asking this court not to issue an order. This argument places me on notice of the state's concerns, and you're aware of mine on behalf of Mr. Dulos. I'm going to continue to make difficult judgment calls, perhaps at my peril. Well, the defense motion for an order should not be interpreted as a motion for sanctions on anything that's happened to this point. It's, he's asking for an order that binds both sides. He, we are already bound, it's a ridiculous right. request. It's the functional equivalent of asking me not to, ordering me not to kill somebody. I promised. I, I'm almost certain I'm going to obey that all day long. Well, are you, you are aware, counsel, of the United States Supreme Court case of Gentile versus State Bar of Nevada, which was, which was decided in 1991. And they talk about these orders governing extrajudicial statements. And they say that the limitations are aimed at two principal evils. One, comments that are likely to influence the actual outcome of the trial and two, comments that are likely to prejudice the jury veneer, even if an untainted panel can ultimately be found. Few, if any, interests under our Constitution are more fundamental than the right to a fair trial by impartial jurors, and an outcome affected by extrajudicial statements would violate that right. And again, I'm quoting from an order issued by United States District Judge Amy Burton Jackson, November 2017, in the case in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, United States of America versus Paul Manafort and Richard Gates, as we all know, he was President Trump's former campaign manager, and Judge Jackson in that case issued an order saying, in order to safeguard the defendant's right to a fair trial and to ensure that the court has the ability to see a jury that has not been tainted by pretrial publicity, all interested participants in the matter, including the parties, any potential witnesses and counsel for the parties and witnesses, are hereby ordered to refrain from making statements to the media or in public settings that pose a substantial likelihood of material prejudice to this case. And that language does track the, our rule of professional conduct 3.6a, and there's actually a local federal rule that Judge Jackson mentions in her order. So, but here's the problem. I don't think this is controversial. Uh, it is, because what a substantial prejudicial risk is, is a, is a judgment call. Yes, it and, is. And it's a judgment call that I believe I have the professional right and responsibility to continue to make whatever this court says. If I walk out of this courtroom this afternoon and one of these young people, or not so young people, depending on who they are, ask me a question pertaining to some item that they've heard about from another person, I'm not going to say, I can't comment on that if it's adverse to my client's interest or substantially if I'm, if I'm, I'm, I'm prejudiced. It's just not going to do it. And I don't think the rules require me to do it. And if the court issues an order, it would probably extend to law enforcement because your your argument is that there have been leaks of investigative material that are not publicly filed in this court. Is that your claim? Also, to the extent to this family spokesman for Jennifer Dumas. I mean, look. You don't want to become involved in a rolling set of evidentiary hearings about who said what to whom. But I can guarantee you that by the end of the day, there will be hundreds of news stories throughout the United States and or the world about this case 
And some of them will contain recaps of items that have, that, that have come from third parties, some from the arrest warrant, some from the Dubos family, some from law enforcement. And I'm going to respond to each one of them if I think that, in my judgment, they substantially in, impact my client's reputation. Um, and they're not, I'm not trying to pitch the jury here. There's not a jury already picked. The concerns in the United States Supreme Court were twofold, prospective jurors and actual jurors. If this were a case in which there were actual jurors set, I would join the state in asking for an absolute gag order on everyone. Because at this point, the record that we have to establish is set, and we can't talk to jurors again to find out whether they've been impacted. But in a case that's in its incipient phases, and when there's a case that is being investigated, talked about publicly, speculated about, that hasn't even been brought yet, which is the murder case, I can't be prospectively bound from commenting on something that hasn't occurred yet. My objective on Mr. Dulos is to make sure he's never charged with murder. Because I think there are substantial reasons to doubt that he can be. And to bar me from making those commentaries is to substantially prejudice him. Counsel, I don't know if any order of this court would issue would bar you in light of 3.6b, but I don't think that the, the court's issuing an order that basically incorporates the rules of professional conduct. It's a non-entity. It's a non-order. Yeah, I mean, again, order me not. Order me not to. Order me not to attempt to fly to the dark side of the moon. And I promise you, I'll obey that order. I'm not obliged to not to try, but if order, but order me not to kill someone today. I'm going to obey that. You don't right. have to issue that order. But counsel, look, going back to the U.S. versus Manafort order that I just referenced from November 2017. What was the practical purpose, in your opinion, of Judge Jackson issuing the order in that case, which also had a very high degree of public interest? First, that's a district court ruling that has not been reviewed by any appellate court, and it's mere dicta as far as this court, not, I mean, it's mere persuasive authority as far as this court is concerned. It's not been reviewed by the United States Supreme Court, and the Nebraska case that I cited suggests that, it is, uh, that, it, that this flies in the face of the Nebraska decision. Were I Mr. Manafort's or a lawyer, I would have sought an immediate appeal of that ruling. Second, the federal courts operate at something like the speed of light by contrast to the Connecticut case. I believe Mr. Manafort's already been tried in that case, and trial was just around the corner. Given the imminence of jury selection, the court may have had concerns, concerns I might have shared if I knew more about that case and how close jury selection was. Third, unlike the Manafort case, um, this is a case where the tail is wagging the dog. The state has brought speculative and flimsy charges against Mr. Dulos at this point as a prelude to the main event, which we hope never to get to, the murder charge. So for all sorts of reasons, I don't believe that uh, that, that, that decision is controlling on this court, both as a matter of law and as a matter of the underlying facts. I, I understand it's not controlling it is persuasive authority, but it seems to me you have a fundamental philosophical disagreement with the issue of such orders in the first place. No, fair? no. I mean, what, but what I have a fundamental disagreement with is ordering me to do something I'm already obliged to do. That I mean, I mean, the state's motion was one paragraph, the first paragraph of a three or four paragraph rule, uh, a professional rule of professional conduct. He says, "I'm ordering. I'm asking this. It's sort of like him asking you that I not commingle client or for an order that I not commingle client funds. I already have that." And so you're going to issue an order that basically says, follow the rules. I will. I'll go out and I'll say whatever I will. If he believes I've broken the rules, what's he going to do? Ask for me to be held in contempt or file or, or, or seek sanctions against my license? He already has the one. To endorse, to have the court endorse silence in this case, um, especially in this case, I think would be a miscarriage of justice. He already has a remedy if he thinks I've broken it. And for me to expect the state to be able to police the police in this case is, is a bridge too far. There are already law enforcement officers that are speaking to members of the press and or possibly to me that shouldn't be doing it and they know they shouldn't be doing it. Are they gonna be held in contempt if they break the order? I alone will be subject to contempt if I comment on somebody who breaks the order. Um, and I just don't think that's fair to Mr. Dumas. It should not be good enough for this court. 3.66b stands as an independent obligation. I'm aware of it. I'm unaware of having broken it. The court's not insinuating. I have not made any finding that, that you've broken the rule. This is a prospective order. In which case, with absent of showing that I've broken it or even that there's probable cause to some suspect I have, why the waste of judicial resources? You don't need the order. I'm already obliged. I understand the obligation. Nothing else on that, Your Honor. I do have one other issue. I'll take that on the papers, then I'll issue a decision shortly on that order, or motion, rather. 
the last issue is I well you consider them. supplemental briefing you've raised a couple of decisions I mean the state did rely on a case um, and I'm responding to right. right. you know, this give know, me a week one week the state wish time to reply or wish to file a brief or yes if you file something I'd like time to reply if need be thank you so one week from today Madam Clerk if there's no calendar up here on this bench uh, that will be August 16th. You file your brief by the close of court business on August 16th. Can I have to the 19th, Judge, just so I've got the weekend? You know it is. So, okay. um, by the close of business Monday, August 19th, stay to file a reply if or it's first brief by the following week. Is that sufficient time? I feel 10, at least 10 or 15 days after this. Thank you. Madam Clerk? Uh, August 26th is the following week. Uh, two weeks would be September September 3rd is the Labor day. Labor day. So do the third term. Thank you. Well, Labor Day is 9-3? No, Labor Day is 9-2. Nine 9-2. Two. Nine two. Nine two. Nine two. Nine two. All right, so ordered. And then we will um, take it up again. We, we do have to set another court date, but also... Just lastly, if I may, Your Honor, yes. I know that uh, I, I wanted to address the defendant uh, attempting to contact uh, Mrs. Farber or uh, his children through third parties. I know that Your Honor indicated as a condition of his release that he not have contact with his children. Uh, there has been some concern from Mrs. Farber that he is attempting to have contact with the children through third parties, and I would just ask that you order that he not do that. Well, I don't know what Ms. Farber has to say, but I know what the truth is, and that is that Mr. Gula's sister, nieces, and relatives from Greece have made repeated attempts to contact her electronically, by telephone, and other means, um, in an effort to maintain the familial ties with the children. We have received copies of correspondence um, sent to them saying they don't want any contact. Mr. Dulos is not engineering that. Well, that's the key. I don't have jurisdiction over the defendant's relatives, but I don't want them acting on his behalf. Again, they're doing indirectly what he's ordered not to do directly. But I did discuss in chambers with counsel the idea that the family court, depending proceeding there, is the best forum to regulate this contact. As a matter of fact, I thought I saw the guardian ad litem here, Attorney Bean. Well, he stepped out. He stepped out. But anyway, he was here earlier. I knew he'd be interested in these proceedings. I wasn't surprised to see him here, but I am aware there was a pending family court matter in this courthouse where issues related to the best interests of the children are, are I understand, Your Honor, but you do have contact. You have to, you do have the ability to order the defendant not to have third parties do that to the extent that they are making contact on his behalf or bequest or that they're doing it to make contact with them to talk about what he wants to say to them. Uh, I'd ask you to order them not that, that not to happen. I don't know how to police that order. If I write a letter on behalf of my sister saying she loves you, children, um, I, I presume she'd want me to say that. Is, is Mr. Dulos going to be hung up if one of the family members says that? So I, I don't know how to police that. If we don't object to it, we understand well, the order. I think it's, a, it's, it's an appropriate order under the circumstances, but again, no one's making any finding at this point of a violation of any existing court order, but we're looking forward, not backward, with respect to these types of orders. And Judge, the one final issue uh, that was discussed in Chambers, it's my understanding the court will uh, consider on the papers particularized requests uh, for Mr. Dulos to attend the deposition of Gloria Farber in her family case and um, potentially have, uh, attend a deposition of Michelle in, the, uh, in a civil suit to which he is, is a party and you had concerns about direct contact and my understanding was I'm invited to write a proposed order that you might review and find acceptable. And if I have the ability to agree to it, I will. If I don't, I'd ask your honor for a hearing. All right, I'll take it on the papers if possible, if we cannot accomplish that, we'll, we'll take it up at a, at a hearing. Also, there's a pending motion to dismiss filed by the defense with respect to the arrest warrant. We yes, Your Honor. The state um, yes, to file I have a new uh, objection or request that I file my objection. Uh, the next court date to be contemplated was September 13th. If I could have something filed by then, and then uh, maybe the 13th we could schedule a lot of Your Honor deals.
Judge, would the court consider hearing a motion to suppress at this point, or do you want that saved for the time of trial? Could we, we, is, is it a is it untimely? No, uh, no but, and I don't know who's going to try to get the, the, the cell phone that was taken from Mr. Uh, Dulos, he gave to police officers at their request, and when his lawyer asked, him back, asked for it back, the state said, you can't have it back. Uh, he didn't give the state of Connecticut an irrevocable gift. He demanded his property back. The state kept it without a warrant. Our view is that that phone and the fruits of their from are, are, are suppressible. Um, and I know it's within the court's discretion to hear these motions before or after the time of trial. I don't know what your view is here. Well, in the absence of a formal written motion and a reply and okay, a further developed record, I don't want to speculate as to whether I would do it in advance of trial or would have a separate hearing limited to that narrow issue involving the investigating officers. I believe this is all recited in the affidavit of arrest. Uh, no, I, I, I've got affidavits of my own from the lawyers who were involved about the attempts to retrieve the phone and the you know, police refusal to give it back. That uh, evidentiary record would need to be developed. Today. Well, I haven't seen any of those documents, Your Honor, so my discovery from counsel has been paltry at least. There's been no demand for any. And I'm going to take a view that the state has taken with me. Um, if you're not going to give me any material related to Mr. Conus's the, the, the disappearance, I'm not going to give you anything I have. Well, we, we're, nobody's here to play hide the ball, so I will take it up if there's an appropriate motion. Okay. Thank you. Right, so thank 9 13, by agreement? Morning. Yes, sir. Thank you. 10 o'clock. Okay, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. We'll stand adjourned. All rise. I will say go.